But if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 15, the last uh, section of the parable of the prodigal son. And we're going to commence our reading uh, this morning from verse 25 to the end of the chapter. So it's um, Luke chapter 15, verse 25. We pick up the story once again. We hear God's word. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. But he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore the father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours come, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Amen. There's a, a couple I know who had two daughters. The couple are not Christians as we would know it and understand it in our sense of being born again, but they're just uh, two decent, really, human beings. They had two daughters. One turned out to be a churchgoer and uh, lived very morally and very upright. The other turned out to be a nutter and on drugs and all the rest of it. And you can't fathom the reason why. I mean, the parents were good parents. They were the same to each child, although each child can be different. We can all make mistakes, we know. Everyone is unique. But at the end of the day, when you look at the lives of the two, you can't put fault in any way upon the parents. And when you come to this parable, remember what we're saying. It's not the parable of the prodigal son. It is definitely the parable of the loving father. You find that there in verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And it is the father who is the one who takes central stage through the whole story. But what a father with all his love. What an experience that he had. He had two sons. And you know the tragedy of it was this. That neither of them loved him. Neither of them loved him. And when you read this parable, you can't ex fail to have a heart that would go out and feel even for our Heavenly Father this day of a world of children which do not then love him. They were both estranged from him. And what happens is simply this, is that uh, in the story, think of what's happened through the whole chapter. If you want to know the story of the chapter, underline one word, lost. And see how many times that word comes up. And then you've got the heart of the gospel. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And if you remember that as we began this account in chapter 15, all the sinners were gathered to him. Remember that today. All the sinners. Whatever type of sinner you are, whatever type of sinner you may have been, whatever type of sin you may have practiced, all the sinners came to him. There's no one which is excluded 
from him. But also then we find the Pharisees and the scribes complain, saying in verse 2, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus comes and gives us this parable. Remember, it's one parable. There were three, but it's about the lost. We're coming now to the climax of it. You know, the Lord Jesus is the great, you know, parable storyteller. It must have been electrifying as he spoke and they listened. And you've got those which are sinners and those which are scribes and they're gathering around and he begins to speak of the two sons and then you come and what happens is he tells the story how the son went in prodigal living and he ended up with the pigs. And when he came home, the father came and received him. And that's what we found last week. There it was in verse uh, 24. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. They had a feast. The food was laid. The fatted calf was killed. And they came this morning as we come to the last lesson. Because the story isn't over. Wouldn't that be a wonderful way to end the film? I'm having a film on the prodigal son. And you have all the uh, things that he went through. The longing of the father. And then he comes home. I would then put the caption, the end. But it's not. But you find here, in now in verse 25, there was another prodigal. The prodigal who stayed at home. And just because this one never went away, don't think for a moment he wasn't as far off from his father as his younger brother. And you find it looked like this. The prodigal who stayed at home. The prodigal who never wondered. There are people like that in the world today. They believe that somehow because they've never wondered. They've never gone down those dark paths. They've never entered into those uh, places of degradation. They have not come and ended up in the pig swine. That somehow that they are something with God. And yet they're as far from God as you could possibly imagine. And as we followed the decline of the prodigal son, can I just pick out some things of the prodigal who stayed at home? Now what happens in verse 25 is this. And now his older brother was in the field. He comes back and as he was drawing near, he could hear the, the music and he could hear the dancing. Don't miss a point that Jesus is picking on. When Jesus mentions, and he heard the music and the dancing, that as uh, he mentions it in the story, the, the, the son uh, says what any one of us would have said. What's this which is going on in the house and in my estate? Now look, that's something normal. But Jesus is not missing the point. Because remember, when Jesus came into this world, they had something against him. He came drinking and, and, and feasting and dancing. And when he was found with, with the sinners and there was uh, the, the parties that they threw, like Levi, there was something you see about these people. Just to mark it down, I know that sometimes we think of those kind of Pharisees. Well, you don't realise, Chris, Pharisees are made up of the introvert personality types. And you know what they like? They kill joys all round. And Pharisees can be perhaps hard work, pretty serious and pretty grumpy. But when you read the account in the gospel, just remember this. Those Pharisees themselves were always feasting, opening up their home. They were sociable. Jesus was invited into their home. But when it came to this, they were people who were, they were against. There was no joy in their heart when it came to the things of salvation and of the sheer grace of God. And not only that, you find here in verse then uh, 26, he asked what it meant. And then in verse 27, uh, your brother uh, has come because he has received safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. 
And then you find here in verse uh, 28, and he was angry and he would not go in. The second thing I want to point out for you this morning is this, is that this uh, uh, son which stayed at home had no love for his brother and had uh, no concern for his care. So what happens? He asks, what's the news? And the servant comes and he says, your brother uh, who was, uh, you know, your brother who was um, come and has been received safe and sound. Mark that down because there be people in the life of the church who perhaps think that they are uh, wonders with God, that they're doing wonderful things. Here's the little man, uh, the older brother. He was in the field. He's been working there. He's coming home. But you know something? He had no heart for the one who was lost and the one then who was safe and sound. And we can be like that. We can be taken up with all the work, doing all the things that we think that God wants us to do, uh, doing uh, our religious uh, uh, devotion, piety, Bible reading, prayers. We can do all that. But then something happens that reveals our heart. And so it happened with this man. When he heard that he was brought home safe, as he was angry. That's a bad place to be. But I want to just pick on it for a moment because when you come to a place of worship, there will be those that uh, for all that they do, they're never happy even when people come home to God. It reveals the poison, the twistedness, the guile, the sadness which can be within our heart. You couldn't get further from what the Father is. He receives him and they marry. He comes and hears about it and he is angry. And when you come and think of that, could I say to you that, it, that what takes place is that it happens. One of the reasons and one of the, the pictures that you learn when a church has lost the gospel is how they come and receive sinners coming back to the church. And when people think that this person and that person should not be found within the place of the church, why have you received such a person? Do you know what this person has done? Listen, we live in a community which is very small. And it's been a thousand times people have told me of the faults of many. And you realise that in their heart, they haven't got a clue of that grace of God. And it can happen in our lives. And when we're pointing the finger, remember what Jesus is doing. Remember what he's teaching, who he is with. And if you want to know in your Christian state, do you have a love for the lost? Do you care that they be saved? Have you spoken to others? Are you evangelising for the lost? Are you going forth with the gospel? If you want to make a fellow Christian man, try spreading the word of God. That's what you find here. See what Jesus is teaching. He is with the sinners. They should be happy. He receives them. But they're not. And they murmured. And they complained. And when we come in our little experience, I know I've used this before, but it never fails to shock me how someone can preach the gospel for 35 years in that work, and then when someone comes to be a believer, instead of being thrilled to bits, that is a total different. And you say, but hang on, that man was a gospel man. But there was something seriously wrong within his heart. Let me ask you the question this morning. What makes you angry? What makes you angry? People are angry over all kinds of things. The trivial things that people go mad about. And then you find this one. He's angry. 
Because his brothers returned. Because the father has received him. Because the fatted calf has been killed. There's something seriously wrong with the life of this elder brother. There's plenty of elder brothers, I assure you, in the life of the church and its experience. But I want you to look now at what happens uh, in verse 28. And it's quite staggering, really, of where we have this picture of the father. Therefore, in verse 28, but he was angry. Verse 28, therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. And if you're ever, uh, if you're ever wondering about the father's love, how deep it is, how wide it is, how great it is, is it not shown here in this parable? Do you see the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, he, he's in this world. Jesus Christ has been sent to this world on a mission from his Father. Don't ever think for one moment that Jesus Christ came into the world to make his Father loving. That Jesus had to come, fulfill all those kind of laws. He had to do it. Live that life. Die on the cross. Take our sins. He had to do it. And then when Jesus finally did all that, then the Heavenly Father can love us. You're wrong. It's because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. And Jesus came into this world because the Father is loving. And you say, how much did he love the world? Well, he loved the world of sinners lost and ruined by the fall. And he loved the prodigal son. And you know what I can say to you today? He loves the one who's in prison, the one who's on the streets, the one who's been on drugs, the one who's been bank robbers, the one who's been murderers, the one who's been pedophiles, the one who's done. He loves this world and he wants them back. But I'll tell you something more, more than all that love. He loves that religious screwed up, bitter, twisted, warped soul which every week is at a place of worship and their faces are hard as stone, their necks would never bend and every week where this spirit of hatred and anger, he loves them. Therefore the Father came out to the son and pleaded with him that's the love of god and you say uh, and we point uh, he is so far greater than us isn't he uh, we may be like that uh, elder son at times with all our spitefulness and uh, lack of response to great things but even if we're not we're ones which point the finger. We say, look at those grumpy, miserable, bunch of pharisaical Pharisees in that place. But God loves them. And he comes out to plead with them. That's how deep and how wide and how great the Father's love truly then is. And then he tells us, you see, you know, something here, and you need to grasp this because it's teaching us something of the gospel. Now, he came out to plead with him, and we'll use the, we see how he pleaded with him. He was lost. He was found. It's been years. What do you want me to do? Uh, you know, what else could I do? You know, how else? But I want you to look. Verse 29 is a real clincher for all of us here today, which we need to learn. Because every one of us has problems in how we relate to the Father. You can't help but feel for this Father. 
Do you know, it's like that in the church. For every one who comes into the church, which makes a journey back to God, do you know, one leaves. One leaves. You say, I know, one, when one comes in, another goes out. Because I don't like the one who's come in. It's happened for 30 years. It's incredible. I want you to think of the Father. It's his great day of joy. Finds one son, another one refuses to come in. Now, now that is important. Because what you actually find here in um, chapter, I think it was, 13, when we look back at that chapter, there was that where we find now, in verse 23, uh, then one of them said, Lord, are few saved? And then he speaks in verse 25. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, the door's not shut, the, the master has come out of the house now, and he is... He is waiting for the elder son to come in. But look what he says here in verse then um, 29 of chapter 13. They will come from the east and from the west and from the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. Well, these will be outside. Now, I want you to look at verse 29. This is the clinching. It's how you and me Relate to God, and it's wrong. It's wrong. And it makes no difference if you're the prodigal who's gone away, or you're the prodigal who's stayed at home. Such is our fallen nature, we have no understanding how God receives us and loves us. I want you to look now at verse 19 of chapter 15. The prodigal son comes home. As he's coming home, he has a speech which he wants to make. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now there are those who are in the church today who have not been saved, but are in the church because of this. They have lived a life of wickedness and of sinfulness, and they have been so overcome with guilt and with conscience, they decided that what they needed to do is to change their ways, say sorry to God, and they come to that place and they say to God, I will now serve you for the rest of my life. And there are those who have come into the church and they're part of the church and that is their experience. They've turned to God and what they believe is that they could make amends in some way because of the life in which they lived. I will now dedicate the few years that I've got left, which is a good thing that you need to do. But it's not the grounds on which God will accept you. I remember uh, hearing the story of a World War II uh, bomber which was going through the cities of Italy. And uh, from our great RAF uh, in the World War II, they had these uh, carpet bombing missions. They were told that they were bombing strategic areas, ammunition factories. But he said, I knew in my heart that we were bombing homes and houses and making people Homeless, killing women and children, making them orphans. He said, when I came back from the war, he used to go around the orphanages, giving sweets to the little children, just feeling to do something. Walked into many a church, he said, all I ever had was these platitudes no one could deal with my guilt and my sin. But that's how he lived his life, trying to make amends. It's a mistake. It can happen. I want to be your servant. That's not how God deals with us. Look at verse 29. Same heart as the prodigal which was away. Lo, these years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Can you think of this father? The second son now. 
I've been here all the time. I have served you. I've been a good boy and girl. I never went away. And yet they never understood the sheer freedom and the love. Can you imagine if your child said that to you? Now there's a place for us to honour, to do right. If we had children, you want them to obey. But I hope it isn't that you love them because they've obeyed your commandments. They've kept their bed tidy. They've cleaned their teeth. They haven't done anything wrong. So you love them. That's not how it works. You love them anyway. This must be like a dagger to the heart. You can't help but weep for the Heavenly Father. There's a world which just does not know of his love and how they love him. Now, this is important. Turn to this. It's in uh, Galatians chapter 4. And I want to show you it is a problem in the church. And what happens in the church of Galatia is that these people have become Christians, but now the gospel has changed. And Jesus and Paul is teaching here. For example, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. When he grows up, although he may have been like that, living in the house, one of the children, but when he grows up, even so, when we were in children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But listen, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And then I'm going to just go, you know, as it says, verse 6, the spirit of verse 7, therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, an heir of God. Don't you understand that today? That the Christian work that you're doing, the Christian that you're to be, it's not under any slavery. It really is not. You are no longer slaves. You are sons and children of God. Of God. We're nearly there. It's, it's, it's an incredible uh, uh, scene. Then he says, I have never transgressed the self-righteousness of this man, the hatred of this man, the joylessness of this man, yet you never gave me a goat that I may make merry. Look, verse 30, but as soon as this son of yours, not even my brother, he came back, he caused shame, he lived like this, you killed the fatted calf. Verse 31, he said, Son, son, you're always with me. Everything that I have is yours. Don't you realize that? This is yours. Every single thing. You say, I never give you a goat. It, you, you've inherited it all. It all belongs to you. And then you see the father pleads with him. I want you to think, it was right. It was right. It wasn't wrong. I, I want you to consider that. You know, self-justification about ourselves before God. Someone, even a conversation yesterday, uh, I was talking to uh, someone from the funeral and I said, what church do you go to? And they said, well, I don't go to church now, but um, I just want a church with a word. That's good. I'm no happy clappy. Well, that's good. I'm no happy clappy. That's what we say. I'm no happy clappy. Well, actually, there's a place to be happy clappy and a place for the gospel where you're happy clappy. And you say, where's that? Isn't it right that we make merry? Is not the exaltation weep with those that weep? Rejoice with those who rejoice? Now, it's easier to weep with those who weep 
than rejoice with someone who's had success, passed an exam, a baby's been born, something's been achieved. We're living in a sick and sour world. But is it not right that we would make merry? Because you see, he has returned. Your brother was dead and is alive again. Now, this is um, electric stuff. The Pharisees are there, murmuring, <laughs> not joyful. There should be something that makes us joyful in life. And here is how it ends. This is it, verse 32. He was lost, was found, was dead, is alive again. That's it. That's the end of the parable. Have you not watched a film? And you know how you like those films to end? The husband coming home, wife running out, arms thrown over, kisses given, all this kind, and it ends, and you've watched the film. They're you reunited, they're brought back. It's there, end, you're happy. Have you ever watched a film and you've left with someone lying on the ground, not knowing if he was dead or alive, if he was going to make it home or not. You think to yourself, what's that ending? What kind of ending is that? Because the ending is this. The door is open. It is not the end. You are the end of the story. And as Jesus was preaching to the Pharisees and the scribes, and the Father is pleading with them to come in to the feast and to be merry, and it's right that we would do this, it's left open for you to walk in. But for you to walk in this day, this is what it will take. You have to enter in to the celebration or you're outside. You have to enter into the joy of the kingdom of God. You are to enter in to the feast that God has given you or are you outside? Miserable, sad and sick of those which are entering in. Have you known of the joy of a sinner who's been saved. You, you need to know that joy yourself. It's the only way uh, that you can, you know, understand it. And I understand there are those in the congregation that don't understand. They don't get it. When, when the bliss of this glorious thought, your sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to that cross and you bear it no more. And they just can't see it. You, you've got to know that yourself. But... Have you had that joy when others said, I've come to Christ, I've been saved? Or are you like that man which is standing outside? That's how he leaves it. He's a great storyteller, isn't he? He's one of the best. I mean, he's absolutely out of this world. And you can imagine what that must have been for those people. Lord,